getting right into this thing, how would you describe what exactly it is that you do? You know, everything that we see online and anything else that you got going on in your life that you want to get into, how would you uh, describe all that? Uh, that's a good question, Gary. I just speak about the essential nature of experience, the essential nature of um, consciousness, maybe you could call it. Um, by by talking about it, uh, you, you're connecting. You know, there's there's deep connection. Sometimes words can invoke presence. Um, and of course, talking about it points at it. You know. Um, for people that are seeking, I kind, of, kind of that's what I do. But in in what we're exploring today, that's what I do. But I'm I'm also a, just a, a normal therapist, you know, helping people with addiction um, issues. You know, whether it's um, primary addictions such as drugs, alcohol, whatever, uh, or process addiction, such as codependency, whatever. I, 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 that's one thing I do as well. But in, in terms of what we're doing today, I guess we're going to be exploring maybe the great matter, if you could call it that, you know, mm. uh, exploring consciousness, which is, which is uh, I, I talk about it in, from the perspective of having had an awakening that, that, that occurred in 1999. So out of the blue just occurred i wasn't i wasn't seeking it it happened um and when it happened it 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 it, it just it, it, it in itself became the inspiration to know what that was on, on on a much deeper level you know it took me away from the usual emotional and mental paradigm of of relating and this opening of reality opened up and I, I, I kind of knew what it was. But of course, talking about it is very difficult. You have to learn. If you've not been seeking, you have to then learn how do you get this across to people, you know? And in, and in doing that, you know, it's led to me sharing that experience with people, um, you know, on retreats or on webinars or, or whatever, people that look at YouTube clips and, and, uh, it's just all come from there really it's all happened by by itself you know there was no intention to suddenly go out and teach it mm -hmm. just kind of naturally happened really so yeah what i do is is in terms of people is is is, is just explore the essential nature of experience consciousness whatever you know yeah awesome yeah now how would you describe the indescribable you know, what did you wake up to in 99? Is there oh. some kind of way that you could guide us into what you saw or what you realized? Mm. Yeah, yeah, no. So it, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, the, the, the um, how, how people fall out of this reality and fall into reality. I think that, that, that mm -hmm. in itself is a book, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. I think I think William James wrote a book, didn't he, called The Varieties of Religious Experience. It's a very old book. I don't know if you're aware of it, but I've heard about it. Yeah, yeah. And it, and it, you know, these things happen uh, spontaneously. So there, I mean there's been books written on it, but in my case, um what happened was uh I'd been working, I I, I was 27. I had an alcohol issue, so I had to deal with that. You know, I had to get help with the alcohol issue. And I went to a 12 step fellowship. And uh, in, in within the first year, I then began to work the program that they suggest you, you, you do. Uh, a, a program made up of spiritual principles. They call it, they call it the 12 steps. And, and, and I guess really that was my first that was my first introduction to spirituality even though before that i was in you know i i, I um pondered deep spiritual 
matters or, or uh, spiritual leanings. I, I wasn't following a spiritual path. I think a lot of children have that, don't they? You know, you, you, when you're young, you think, God, why am I here? You know, mm -hmm. why, what's all this about? You know, yep. And 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 I, 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 but I had never followed a spiritual path. I went to a Christian school, so I was inspired by the Gospels. I, I always felt there was some truth in the Gospels, but even then, I, I never really uh, explored the the deeper meanings of that until 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 at the age of twenty seven. I found myself in recovery from alcohol addiction, given a twelve step program, which is a set of principles, spiritual principles that you actually apply, learn. First of all, you learn them, and then you apply them in your life, and. Uh, that was the beginning, really, for me. That was when I began seeking a way out of um, the dilemma that I was in, because the dilemma that I was in, you know, was was a, a self-imposed dilemma. It was a, an alcoholic mm -hmm. dilemma. And I knew I was the problem, so I knew that to get out of that, it had to be something other than me, something, you know, I had to find basically what i was told was you know what you need is a spiritual experience to overcome this 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 addiction you know but for me looking back and i didn't know this at the time but like a lot of people these days i never really even even when i was given the spiritual principles i didn't work them in a spiritual way at first I, I worked them in a person-centered way. Does that make sense to you? You know, I worked them in a way that was more therapeutic rather than um, rather than uh, spiritual. I don't know if that makes sense. It's very you know, but there are these sort of distinctions because you know a lot a lot of a lot of um, person-centered attitude or, or techniques have come from treatment centers and and it kind of got into the trust that fellowship that i was in so so it kind of so i got caught up in that mix as well so i ended up just person-centeredly working this program and and it was me working it on all my patterning and on my you know my my my, my you know coming to see what was driving me coming to see how i was reacting to it mentally and emotionally and, and sort of kind of sorting out these patterns and developing new patterns, which then, def which became a new sense self, which became defined by boundaries. I was starting to develop boundaries, very person centered. So, although I was working a spiritual program, it was done in a person centered way. And th this went on until for three and a half years. Three and a half years, I was working this spiritual program, but in a person centered way. Mm -hmm. And 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 after three and a half years, I found I found myself. Starting again, I thought, okay, I've, I've been sober for three and a half years. No, two and a half years, actually. Two and a half years. I thought, let's, let's start again. I was 28 by then or, or whatever, and, and, um, or 28, 29 or something, 29, I think. And uh, I thought I'd go back to college, do an access course, and, and go to university and study philosophy or something. Just, just start again because, um, I, you know, after the drinking, stopping drinking, I couldn't go back to the old. Mm-hmm. Could go back to the old career. So um there was still like a yearning. There's something in you that's like <sighs> Yeah, there was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was. There, there was a, there's always been something yearning, especially, you know, I I I I knew the old career I couldn't go into. But I, I thought what I would do is because I've always loved knowledge, you know. I mean, I'm I'm sure you you, you get that yourself, you know, when you're a child, you know, I was I was always fascinated by philosophy or or anything, yeah. especially you know, paranormal, that sort of things, you know. Mm -hmm. All the mysterious stuff, and and so I went to college and I, and I studied for a year and I and I and I, you know, studying studying sociology, studying psychology. These were two of the things that I was studying. And 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 when I came face to face with uh, sociology and psychology, it was like, my God, this is it. This is I'm going to find I'm going to find the meaning here. You know, because mm -hmm. sociology when it opens up, it's like wow, society. When you study society, it's like amazing. When you've not done any of that inquiry into society, it, you know, it's an eye opener. Especially when you you know you've been out of it for for ten years on drink, you know, and and yeah. all your adult life on drink. So suddenly you're you're you're, you're starting again, and and then and studying psychology as well, which I just seem to have a natural. Uh, thing for i just did this natural way of understanding psychology and, and the philosophical sort of stuff and um 
and it made me, and that's when I began asking lots of questions, you know, and, and I would ask lots of questions in, in the, you know, sort of tutors, you know, psychology, psychology, you know, about behavior, whatever. And, and uh, for instance, you know, with psychology, I remember we were studying Piaget, okay, about, the, the, you know, intellectual development, okay, Piaget, these four stages of intellectual development. And, you know, you start off with the concrete and so on and so forth until learning becomes more abstract. And, and there, there comes a fourth stage. And I remember the tutor said, but not everyone gets the fourth stage. <laughs> and That's I'm thinking, stage. well, yeah, I'm thinking, well, I better find out what the fourth stage is then because I'm going to, I'm going because that's, for me, that was challenging, you know. And so, uh, and, and of course, the fourth stage is, is, is where people go to university where they're able to entertain an abstract thought, you know, uh, in, in a, in a, uh, you could say in a critical thinking way, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so, so the, but I, I found that fascinating. And then with, so soci with sociology, I, I had the same, the same thing, you know, there, there was, there was a, you know, from not studying anything, suddenly I'm, I'm studying sociology and we start studying Marx, Marxism, and Marx's theory, and and uh, Marx. In, in in studying that theory, I learned of false class consciousness, and of course, when when the word these words are spoken from the tutor, and we, you're going through the slide projectors, and you're you're going through this, and you're reading it, and you think false class consciousness. That sounds interesting. What's false about consciousness? So I, I kind of had this mind that was just grabbing on to these things trying to work out reality and 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 in that i guess i was trying to find myself really because yeah. i i guess I, I i i still didn't know who i was and and i guess there was this compensation yeah and yeah. uh and then one day after a year it was a year or something yeah yeah and 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 i i at the end of one of the classes it was a sociology class the, the bell rang everyone shot off and i and i was Still, I, I was the last to leave. I was still talking to the tutor, and um, and I'm asking the tutor about false class consciousness. What, what is false class consciousness? And this is, you know, I was a bit, you know, a bit. Uh, and she just looked at me and she said, uh, "You're not your thoughts and your feelings," you know. Mm. And no one had ever told me that before, because up until that point, um, I'd been working a twelve-step program in a person-centered way, which means the whole investment is how you perceive, how you how you view your thoughts and your feelings. Like you how you as your thoughts and your feelings? Yeah. Yeah. So th that's the difference between person-centered consciousness and then an actual, truly spiritual consciousness truly. is the Absolutely. difference of um, identification with your thoughts and feelings or not? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That Exactly that, right? So I was still in that place of relating from my my thoughts and feelings consciousness my personal consciousness and i had no other i had no other paradigm i had no other so and so in relating from that my investment was that so everything i did was just i'd better fix that feeling i'd better fix that pattern i'd better learn how to share this feeling i'd better learn yeah. how to get okay, better and that's all it was so it was a complete investment so my whole recovery investment was person centered and then mm. This tutor said, "You're not your thoughts and your feelings," and that's and my investment then just fell to the floor. Yeah, because I knew that what she was saying was true, mm -hmm. and I, and it was something in me responded to that, and that's something in me I couldn't I couldn't distinguish that from my person centered uh, worldview, you know. But yeah. there was something that just kind of knew what she was saying, but it, it was struck dumb, and so I went home, and when I went home. Um, it took a few days, but it really played on my mind. It really played a lot. I, I, it really shook the roots of my recovery. I, I just saw that what I'd done was I'd worked on myself in relation in, in, in relation to a prescribed program, and I'd, I'd got it disastrously wrong. And and mm -hmm. and I felt so dishonest, and I don't know why that is. Why did I feel so dishonest? I felt so dishonest, and I felt I'd done it wrong. And uh, and and in view of everything I did, I couldn't see anything in the absence of that. I was totally clueless. So um, a few days later, I found myself just in the prayer position on the floor in the living room. Wow. And I asked God to take away my mind because I knew for some reason, because it was this person-centered recovery that I was following and not a spiritual one, 
I ask God to take away my thinking, take away my mind, thinking that this attachment to the mind is not going to is not going to transcend the body. So I'm never going to be, I'm never going to escape this person-centered, you know, self-contracting identity. I thought, then I've got because I've been using the mind, you know, and I, I thought, well. I'm going to ask God to let to let go of that. I'm going to let go of it, you know, totally, you know. Um, because I knew, because in the 12 steps, I knew that in the third step, it says we turn our will and our life over to the power of a greater, a power greater than self, right? We turn our will and life over to a power greater than ourself. Mm. And uh, I thought, well, I've, I've got to, well, what my will is my use of the mind. It's what I'm doing with the mind and it's not doing anything. So I, I um, prayed to God. I said, please, you know, take away my mind. I don't know why. That it just seems to be the only option. So totally hand over the will and life. Mm-hmm. And so I did. And um, I had a complete, utter spiritual awakening, a complete self-realization as a result. Wow. You know, yeah. Um, what happened was, as soon as I, as soon as I came to that point of surrender. Um, in prayer you know i felt i i i there was a letting go of the mind there was a just an awareness because I, I i then found myself just being aware of this dilemma that i i can't transcend via the mind and the dilemma here is i identify myself as a mental and emotional paradigm of person centered reality so i was just in this place of awareness emptiness and 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 suddenly i just felt where i wasn't identifying where i was in a place of prayer I felt the tension, the knot of identification, the tension that I had to the mind, whatever you call that, uh, attachment. I felt it starting to undo. I felt it starting to, it was starting to expand in a way where I was no longer attached to it. So I guess the self, the, the, the identification to the mind being the experiencer was now beginning to undo. And I didn't know that at the time I just felt this contraction opening up. And as it was opening up, I felt mentally I was going beyond my mental identity, and which is quite disconcerting, as you can imagine, you know, yeah. if if you've never I'd, I'd not even read any Ramana or anything, you know, I just, you know, did this. And um because it said in the 12 stage, you know, we we totally had it over, turn it over. So I did that and this and this tension just expanded and it was quite disconcerting, but I knew to remain as as the awareness, just as the awareness, just 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 go with it. I had nothing to lose, you know, because what what I what led up to that was a, just a complete dishonesty, which is what happened. So mm. suddenly it just went through a complete dissolution. Yeah. And and suddenly where there used to be an eye. Uh, a center, a center point of I being a thinker within the mind had gone. And what was left in the absence of this thinker in the mind, because really that's where it is, it's between our ears, you know, that subjective thought I that you get from looking at your body and the mind becomes the body and you've got this mental subjective thought. And then, and then from that thought, you believe you're the thinker of all these other thoughts, you see. So there's the duality, there's the, there's the attachment, there's the ego. And and suddenly that this this thinker had just gone through complete dissolution and the mind just opened up as an extension of pure consciousness. That's all it was. So the mind, even, even the mind changed. It became it became what the world was. It became the representation of the world. I just could see. And the mind was like the Buddhists say, the mind was like the sky, you know, just this open, and it was in complete association to the witness. Yeah, it was in complete association to this witness. Mm. And so there was this nothing, and I felt the peace, and I felt peace of mind for the first time. Mm. I'd never felt peace of mind before. I'd always been that contracted eye, got to work it out, got to find it. Suddenly there was this no efforting, just this open, uh, wide open space of reality and the mind just being in complete association to that. And and so it was like the mind was a reflection of of what I am as the witness and the witness was becoming as the mind. It was all one, you see. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and just for a moment, 
there was this revelation there was this there was this understanding that came from the witness only no 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 there was no um thought at all really and then uh so this prayer to god to have him take away my mind <laughs> took away my attachment to the mind you see <laughs> hallelujah and yeah hallelujah it was hallelujah and uh and then after a few seconds of that, to be honest, I don't know how, how long, because there was no sense of time, really, but it all happened in one evening. And then suddenly there was a pull. I felt a pull. And uh, there was a pull to another vortex that started to open, like the one in the mind, uh, that, that contraction, suddenly in the heart area. Uh, suddenly there was this like a whirlwind uh, vortex started to spin. It started to open. And the reason, looking back, is because there was no contraction holding it there, there was nothing keeping it together as as a, a person-centered reality suddenly now that is starting to open and as it began to open it, it, it had more power than the mental attachment the emotional attachment is is obviously very is stronger and as it opened for some reason, I saw I, I saw all the visual representations of of my attachments, emotional attachments to my identity, to the earth, to everything, to being man, to being everything, everything, every attachment that directed my ego, that directed my attention, came from this emotional base. And as it began to open, everything's going away, and it's almost as if it's just happening, and all I have to do is consent just remain as that awareness just watch mm -hmm. and just remain totally open and so i did and it was more disconcerting and the last thing that went in in terms of my identity was i was shown jesus you know the like a cross like a little jesus you know and of course it, it was the the jesus of my childhood that i developed this emotional bond with this emotional um self consolation of of Jesus and it was showing it and and that 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 was the last one and, and it really really was mm. quite something to let go of you know and I had to go you know I had to be okay with that and suddenly that and suddenly then the whole thing just went through dissolution and as it went through dissolution um this uh, the body attachment then appeared and the body attachment appeared as an abyss as a black abyss just opened up and being pulled into that I remember this voice saying, this is what you've been running away from all your life. This was the avoidance. And mm. uh, and what this was, looking back, I know now looking back, I didn't know that at the time, but this was the body identification. These are the three knots, you know, the mental, emotional, and the physical. And this abyss just opened up, and I just got sucked into it as consciousness, not knowing anything, what was going to happen or whatever. And... and um, and I, and you know, there was no pulling back. I guess if I tried to pull back, maybe I could have done, but I didn't. I had nothing to lose, mm -hmm. and it felt like I was going to die, and it was. And I did. I died. I died. I I got pulled into this abyss and entered into a, a non-existence. And for a s split second, there was a falling into this absolute reality, and then suddenly a coming to. And when I came to. I was in a, a place of complete self-realization, complete self-realization. I, I experienced the complete ego death, yeah. And uh, and then coming to, I could see. I could see, not from the person-centered paradigm, but I could see from this pure consciousness that was in relation to a ground of all being, being an absolute. And that in itself was the hallelujah moment. That that itself was, wow. Wow. I could, you know, I could never, no one, I remember, I remember the thought arising, no one could have shown me this. Yeah. No one yep. could have shown me this. No book. Nothing. No podcast. To die to it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Just had to die to it. And it was disconcerting to say the least but um mm. but that's what happened uh that's what happened gary that that wow. just happened all by accident it happened one evening when 
I realized that I'd compromised my recovery through my own person-centered um, building of, of a new self. I was doing it myself. But when I let go of it all, suddenly there was the true self came into being uh, through surrender only, you know. Mm -hmm. Amazing, isn't it? Incredible. You know? It's very powerful. And that was very well spoken. Wow. Mm. Now, do you think that is the essence of the, quote, spiritual journey is reaching a point of exhaustion of your exhaustion of your dishonesty absolutely that you've yeah. been living in and then the only yeah. way out of that is surrender in devotion yeah. to something greater than your person-centered orientation well said gary wow <laughs> um thank you yeah no no well said um yeah i i do i do the way you just frame that um the exhaustion yeah um and it's also a dilemma isn't it this is the dilemma because when you get to that point the dilemma is being exhausted but are you exhausted enough not to keep trying to do it yourself keep you know because you can yeah. you, you know what it's like you know you think no, no what, what if i do this what if i do that it seems like but, that's what happened with you is like you got exhausted but then you tried uh, to use the mind to figure out the mind in some kind of way you used it, the yeah, self to I figure did. out the self but then eventually you came to uh came into really what you were looking for through surrender yeah yeah i was i was exhausted Mm -hmm. and uh and i tried everything i think that was the last avenue because um you know when you're doing a person-centered type recovery and you're working on everything and if you if you're as dysfunctional as me you know because my, <laughs> even before i drank i was dysfunctional as anything i come from a redneck sort of family uh, you don't talk about emotion. british rednecks you guys have rednecks yeah, over there? yeah. <laughs> there aren't there aren't british rednecks trust me and uh <laughs> So you come from this redneck family that that were wild, really. You, you don't talk about feelings. You don't talk about you just, you know, strong work ethic and you, you get on with it, you know. And um, so, so, yeah. I mean, exhausted. I was exhausted. I, I was absolutely cornered. I think I I was cornered by my own person centered, you know, entrapment. Really. Um, yeah. I yeah. think that's the case for all of us. We're all think so. a little think bit so. discombobulated in one way or the other. It's interesting though, isn't it? Because I, I've obviously I've worked with a lot of people now, but you know, I mean, I just look at the threshold, my own threshold for what can I put up with in terms of my own identity sort of, um, uh, you know, being caught up in this identity or whatever, this I, this ego. And I look at other people, I think some people go much further. It's like, you know, mm. I've just told you, not your thoughts or your feelings. And they're like, all right, okay, what does that mean? And then you're trying to work it out. And mm. it's just, uh, it's incredible, really. Yeah. 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 It's uh, interesting how easy it was. I don't know if easy is the right word, but how it clicked so yeah. fast when somebody said that to you, but you could repeat that millions of times exactly. to others and it doesn't click. So it was just like exactly. right time, right yeah. place for that to be bestowed upon you. I, yeah, I was. They, they say you don't, you don't ready to pop. I think they say, isn't it? Yeah. You know? yeah. And uh, and I like that saying because it is. It's like popping. And and um, I was I was ready to pop. The fact that the fact that I understood the dilemma itself. You know, mm. that the mind cannot transcend the body. I thought, hang on. If, if my investment is thoughts and feelings and trying to change them creates new boundaries that create a new sense self. The new sense self, is just an idea. And I'm using the mind, but the mind can't transcend the body. So I, there's nothing I can do. And, and just, and I, I, I realized the dilemma, you know, it, it, but it was painful. It was painful before, before the awakening, it was painful. It just felt, you know, when you feel dishonest, um, what's the other word? Um, um, Inauthentic inauthentic thank you yeah thank you inauthentic and that's a horrible place to be yeah yeah mm. complete alienation from your essential nature and and again i see this all the time you know when you look at things like borderline personality disorders or cluster b and you know uh, 
And you can see it, can't you? It's the further away someone comes from their essential nature and gets caught up more identified with their mind, the more these things appear, you know, all illnesses, all psychological problems, you know. Yeah. My big interest is the popping point, as we spoke of, the spiritual awakening, mm. because that's when everything changes. Once you see it, you don't unsee it. But the hard part, it seems, is to be able to see it. Like, what do we have to do or maybe not do in order to come to this realization? And what I've come to find is it's different for every single person, every single person. We all see the same thing, per se, but yet how one goes about seeing this is uh, it's completely different. There's no... There's no prescription, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Like we have certain practices such as meditation and self-inquiry that can kind of get you there. But ultimately, that even has to be let go too. The methods and practices you have to let go in order to be able to see this. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know what you want to say to that. It's just uh, interesting to me how like we all have our different popping points, right? Yeah, we do. We do. Everyone has a different reaction to life in a way that has them just stop you know because it is i mean this is i remember there's two things i remember one thing i remember being you know I, I, when i was discovered as someone who'd had this self-realization on um a zen a zen master in bristol um took me under their wing and, and showed me how, uh, it, it, how she would hold meetings and um i remember she had a book on her shelf and it said how to stop a book mm. mm-hmm. <laughs> on how to stop how to just stop you know <laughs> yeah and 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 another thing I, I met another another one is um you know saint john of the cross the dark knight of the soul no no mm-hmm. sorry no forgive me mm-hmm. um the book uh the cloud of unknowing christian classic have you ever read that the cloud no. of Un- never even heard of it it's a great book. Do check it out if you get the chance. It's up to you, but it's a great Christian classic, and it's yeah. uh, anonymously written. It's a great book. Oh wow! And and one of my favourite quotes is in it, and it describes this 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 very dilemma. It says, um, "It's by it, it's by entering into your unknowing, going beyond what you know, that we find God." Mm. Okay, mm. and what that means. Going in your unknowing is your awareness right now without it being attached to anything. It's the place, it's that place of meditation. It's that place of, uh, it's got, it doesn't hold any content, does it? There's a, the, the, the backdrop awareness holds no content. Yet it's the intelligence, isn't it? It's the knowing, you see. And that knowing is unknowing. It's not like the person-centered consciousness where you've got all of this acquired knowledge and say, well, I know this right now. I'm sitting here cross-legged right now. I'm I'm doing this right now. I'm reading this. There's an awareness that just knows nothing right now. And and even looking back when I when when I asked God to take away my mind, there was this awareness that was just observing, and it doesn't have any any content whatsoever. And that that's what's called the unknowing. Okay, that's the unknowing. That's the unknowing. Yeah. And then when you're in this place of unknowing, it, the, the, the second part is we, we go beyond what we know. So we let go of our acquired knowledge, the person-centered view, the, the mental picture we have of ourselves. Just stay in that awareness and let go of everything you know, right? And then, and then and it's in that that you find, and it's in the absence of all that that you come to find the great matter, the 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 substratum reality we call uh um we we call the essential nature you know mm. so so just from that quote it kind of defines this this process itself but how you understand that how you do that is i guess is a personal thing but ultimately it's can you just stop can you remain as awareness now and distinguish that awareness from the person centered you or the person-centered I or ego. If you can do that, then you are in your unknowing. And you can then, in detaching from what you know, go beyond what you know. And in the absence of all of this, if you're lucky, because you can't do this by grace, you may find God, you see. Interesting, mm-hmm. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
there's a lot of people that are in this realm that don't want to use the G word. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, right? Because there's a lot mm. of um, falsity attached to it from years mm. and years and years of dogma. And I think this is the true essence of God, if we can try to describe it. It is that sense of unknowing that you just described, that freedom, and just like that awe, this awe, it's just complete awe. Right, yeah. this direct experience, this direct realization of just, just ah, oh. and um, it's God, isn't it? yeah, that's the God, that's the God, uh, that's what I would, uh, that's what I mean by God. It, it, it's what is the, you know, what is the essential nature? What is that aliveness? You know, what is that non location, non locality that is vast? You know, when awareness is in relation to the essential nature, suddenly there's a vastness. There's a it's God. There's a freedom. There's yeah. a yeah 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 but god i i use the word god because i've always been okay with it you know yeah. but you are right some people don't like it so so because some people say oh they don't like the concept they think god is but i'm using a concept to point out i mean my concept god is not god you know <laughs> yeah exactly it's the word it's it's like you might say no i prefer aliveness again it's just the word isn't it you know yeah it but that's matter. just me i've never i've never been uh hung over on that i've always been quite okay with it really the word god just means I remember when I when I first got into recovery from alcoholism. I remember they said, "Right, you've got to find you've got to you've got to find God as you do understand Him or it or whatever you know your own concept." And I thought, "Okay, well, yeah, it's just for me. It, it's just the it's it's that absolute you know business, whatever that is that that intelligence in the universe you know certainly not a guy on a cloud holding a star you know it's mm -mm. No. god is just reality the ultimate reality the prime mover you know it's yeah. just words really yeah it's work but you are right some people don't like and of course if, if you know I, I i got sober with people you know like lapsed catholics and stuff like that that had the guilt complex you know not all mm. some some catholics were had, had, had a beautiful spirituality because there's a lot of there's a lot of, um, you know, there's some beautiful Christian mysticism, you know, around Catholicism. But there are those also that just, you know, um, had a hard time growing up with, with certain aspects of Christianity and couldn't get past it, you know. So mm. um, God God was a, you know, they'd have a awful reaction to God. Yeah. Understandably so. It could be traumatized. Understandably so. Absolutely, yeah. So I wouldn't, you yeah, maybe I'd change my language with someone like that. Yeah. yeah. It depends who you speak to, I guess. What's the best like, word you think, Gary? What's the What's the best word you think? The oh, great, yeah. like my favorite one is. We'll see what's gone. What is it? Uh, I don't know. I I would say God, as well, or the divine, maybe. Just well, the divine. divine's got a bit of a divine has got a bit of a, would you reckon a religious connotation? Yeah, my friend, my friend in Amsterdam calls it the. He, he said, "Can we talk about the great matter?" He calls it the great matter. Mm. It's a beautiful way of talking about reality call it reality that's good everybody's got their own twist on it i like to say the truth is one and the wise call it by many names but that's not one word <laughs> that's a phrase <laughs> <laughs> yeah many many yeah. many different names and none of them do it justice they just point the way they're just they're just pointers aren't they you know um yeah it's just pointers that's it man yeah, that's yeah. all we can do is point. This is just one big pointer for anybody listening in the future. This is all just a pointer, hopefully. This is all pointing. The words are not it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wonderful thing, if I can just state something. Um, I remember after the awakening, I began to inquire into the nature of that reality. You know, you know, you know, I, I, I began to realize that abiding as that reality was was um was liberating. There was no tension. There's no self-contracting. There's just this open reality to everything. And then, you know, I began to learn that it's the root source of everything. It's the root of everything. You know, it just is what it is. And and um, mm -hmm. and I remember I, I began reading, you know, Indian literature. You know, the Gitas and stuff like that, and uh, whatever the Upanishads. And I remember one sage saying that the mind becomes the thing. And I thought mm -hmm. that was the best way the mind could be described in 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 its function and and in what it is. You know, it's like, um, it's like you look at a cup, and the mind becomes the word cup, the thought, 
cup. You, you, you internalize that. The mind becomes it by speaking cup, isn't it, right? But we know that the word is not the thing. And it's the same with God, you know. We know that the word God is not God. It's just the mind becoming a concept of, uh, you know, pointing at something much deeper, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. The always mind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Another word I like to use is self, but not self as in the egotistical self, the self that is mentioned in the Upanishads, the capital S self. That's I like that. It can get tricky. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Really. I like it too, but it can get tricky yeah. because if you're yeah. diving into Buddhist doctrine, they're all about no self. Right? And this is this got me confused a little bit. I'm like, all right, so they're all about <laughs> no self. But then you go into the Upanishads and the Gita. It's all about the self. So I'm like, wait, what are we doing here? But they're actually talking about the same thing. They're actually speaking about this essence that we're speaking about, but they're using the same word. And that's where it can get tricky, right? Because we use similar words with different definitions per se that could could mix the mind up and only cause more attachment. But yeah, point of my story is I like self, like the primordial self. self. I, I agree with you. I think that's the Ramana as well, isn't it? Is the self mm-hmm. or the mm-hmm. I? He's he, like Ramana uses the word I, doesn't he? Yet, yeah. yeah, we know that the I is 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 a self contracted sort of attachment identity or something. But he say no, 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 take that out, and that is the I. Consciousness itself is the I, or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I like also where you know when consciousness sees into itself, it is the self. Things like that. It's like when awareness itself, when it comes away from the attachment to identity or the body, it can rest in itself and know it is the self. There's an absolute self element, you know, the non-locality. And that that's beautiful. As 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 I'm like you on that. I I like the word self. But you've got the small self. Yeah. (laughs) It can get tricky, like I said. I think Mm. there is something that um how do I put this? Um, let me think for a second. It's more about how we use our words. And there's not just one word that will ever do it, like we said. But there's a certain way of how we mix up the words. Like there's a certain essence to this understanding and how it's conveyed that sometimes is able to just get somebody to reach that popping moment, right? And it, it might take Uh, a little more than just one word but it's like how they're formulated that allows the opportunity for somebody to unlock you know unlock the doors to perception so um it's not like there's no prescription of how to go about it sometimes it's about the person that is saying it and how they say it that only they could say that only in their dharma could be able to convey it right but it has to come from a point of understanding like they have to truly understand it themselves in order to convey it it's like something i feel like i don't know how to describe it but this this understanding this teaching is only able to be taught if the person truly understands it themselves you can't parrot it you can't quote stuff from scripture i mean you can but it only really hits when somebody understands and sometimes you don't even have to say anything like i've heard stories of ramana not even saying anything and just his presence makes people understand but the point is and maybe you can agree or disagree you have to understand it yourself in order to be able to speak like that and if you don't then getting back to that authenticity one can just sense the inauthenticity in somebody's words at least i do at least i can tell when somebody's not about it when somebody's just repeating something that they heard on the internet and then i can on the opposite spectrum side of the spectrum tell when somebody really understands and they're not saying anything different that i never heard right they're just saying something that i've probably heard a million times but it's how it's said it's the subtle transmission in the word that goes beyond words you know? No, no, yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, it, it can look quite silly, can't it, when people uh, have a concept of awakening and they're and they're talking about awakening from a conceptual point of view, and it and you can see that um, that they're not coming from a place of liberation. You see, and and yeah. it can look it can look a bit okay. What book have you read? You know, or okay, that's a great theory, and you're just talking about it. It's very conceptual, but. Um, 
Crikey, that's a great question, though, Greg. I'm gonna, uh, sorry, I called you Greg. It's not Greg. It's Gary. It's okay, I get that. Um, For some reason, people really? call me Greg. Yeah, <laughs> call me okay, whatever Dave. you want. <laughs> I get called I get called David a lot. Funny enough. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a strange <laughs> thing. Nonsense. Um, but the, the power really is is in the transmission, isn't it? it it's, yeah. It, it's what I find is is when you're relating from liberation, right? Which is not, you know, when, when awakening occurs, it's not the hardest thing in the world to do. It's natural. It's a natural uh, thing that you can just, what I call dropping. Okay. So I can yeah. drop now as I'm doing it now. Everyone's laughing at Steve's dropping, you know, whatever, but you can drop now. You, you can, you can allow the awareness to center into the body and, and um, relate from itself coming away more from the, the outward expression. And you can, when you're relating, from this um, liberated uh, consciousness, you're relating from a non-local uh, aspect of reality that's got nothing to do, as we say, uh, with, with the non-personal. And from there, you can merge with somebody. You can actually yeah. uh, connect, again, without even speaking, you can actually connect with somebody, you know, because the reality body and the reality body merge, you know, the, the realized consciousness merges with consciousness. Whereas, when you're when you're talking from the person centered way, I can give you thoughts and you can give me your thoughts, but they don't merge. Mm -hmm. We can agree on thoughts, we can even connect on thoughts, we can even connect on having the same emotional reaction to something and, and feel a connection there. But when when you when you come away from all of that and just relate from the the, the deepest, uh, when awareness goes within and merges with the self. And and then you can then merge with the self in others, and it's yeah. um, it's different. It, it's a different teaching. And and when you speak from that, and and you can merge with somebody, you can actually uh, where you're merging with somebody, and and really having that deeper dialogue of consciousness. If something's come up for them, you can see that, and where you're seeing that, they're seeing that. So that object that may be appearing in consciousness, but where they're merging with you, is a different experience, totally. Mm -hmm. totally different i don't know if i've explained that uh well enough but it's, uh, it's, well, a, big, good. it's a big exploration really that one yeah i feel that 100 percent, and that's why they say some sages can read minds because in a way they kind yes. of are you become yes. the other mind there is only one mind and uh exactly. yeah it's uh it's like superpowers in a way people might think we're crazy if they don't know any better i mean most likely if anyone's listened this long they understand they have some kind of inkling of understanding of what we're talking about but cities. to the cities exactly yeah to the layman they're like what what are you guys talking about but hey, it's weirdo. true look at that weirdo i come from <laughs> slough I'm, I'm from the back end of slough i'm a weirdo for women it's not <laughs> wait where where do you come from oh sorry um because you're american aren't you are you in america yeah whereabouts are you outside of boston outside of boston so you have great names in america Boston, Chicago. We have mm -hmm. things like Scunthorpe and Hull, you know, um, or Slough. We have Hull. No, no, no. Sorry? <laughs> a lot of the places where I live are actually named after places in England. It's New England. That is true. That is true, actually. You're not wrong there. Mm -hmm. um, but where I, I, I grew up in a place just outside of Slough, and when I say Slough, I, I don't mean to put it down. I love Slough. It, Slough is where I grew up. It's where my friends live. And we, it's where we used to play and all sorts. It just so happens to be quite quite a big industrial town, So, which was good because there was oh, lots yeah. of work and all of that. But surrounding Slough, we had Maidenhead, uh, you know, uh, Henley, all, all these places that were green and beautiful. You had the Thames. It just so happened we lived near near, near a lot of places where people worked and um but it's good. But it had a bad name because Sir John Betjeman uh, wrote a poem stating, come you for any bombs and drop on Slough. Ever oh. since then, it's had a bad reputation, but it, it shouldn't really. It's a great place, I'll be honest with you. But because mm. it's industrial, it's not the, you know, living in an industrial town, but, you know, it's you haven't got time to ask questions about the nature of consciousness and stuff like that. Some, I'm sure some people do, but it's not a common, common thing and Definitely people are too not. busy you know yeah so you're so, from slough uh, yeah yeah well i'm just outside slough the place called Langley. Yeah, yeah yeah so your point is uh i have no idea where i, I don't know why i even said all of that to be honest uh, where were we? <laughs> well we were at if people were listening in and they're like what are these crazy guys talking about and you oh, were saying, we're talking oh, yeah about this guy's from slough they're like well come on what's, what's going on here 
But this is the truth, man. This is this is real. <laughs> this is real yeah. than real. And all we can really be is a testament. I like to say mm. that this is this is actually um, to speak your truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's hard to do that when, you know, I remember in the beginning waking up and thinking that this is a game changer. I'm no longer Steve. You know, <laughs> yeah, Self-contraction exactly. of that, that mental and emotional knot that was a, a, a reaction to being a body, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what it is, body identification. Uh, when that fell away, I was completely liberated. But how do you ex explain that to people? I mean, uh, if I went to a psychiatrist or a counselor, well, you know, Steve, you've had a nervous breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. something like Yeah, some people would think that. But I knew that it was liberation. I knew that because I've been working the 12 steps, I knew it was an awakening. And I was very happy with that, happy in that, uh, liberated in that. And, 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 and uh, I, I, I just wanted to explore that from that as that to find out how how do you live as that you know because mm. it's a different paradigm to the person's sense of paradigm all of that stuff had to go and you've got to learn how to embody that you know it's yeah. fascinating stuff a completely different paradigm it's like mm, really it just 180 it's a hunt it's a oh, exactly it's a complete 180 yeah. i mean i like to say everything changes but nothing changes at the same time <laughs> you know it's the You're world too is sound for me <laughs> <laughs> that's good no it's good Go on. the world is still here it's still appearing as it appeared yet the way that we view it is yeah. completely different and in that is the freedom to be in the world and not of it exactly i'm glad i like the way you said that because i, I remember when the awakening occurred i remember thinking i'm here but i'm not here so <laughs> so i'm in the world but not of it you know, mm -hmm. I know that the experience of the world is not the world either. This is where it gets, this is where you go down the rabbit hole. You think, God, the experience of the world is not in this subjective I. It's in this nothing. So this nothing is the experience of something. So the something doesn't exist separately from the nothing. <gasps> There's nothing. There's that, no, you know, it's like, whoa, you know, but I was quite happy being nothing because it was liberating, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It may seem daunting to the mind, right? <laughs> Just a bit. It's nothing. There's nothing going on. But in actuality, that's freedom. That's the most freeing thing that one could come to realize. It is. It's ultimate freedom. Ultimate freedom. Yeah. Ultimate freedom. That's it's you might not think you want it, but in some way there is that yearning. You, it's not even a want. It's just like maybe that is what we want. I don't know. We, if we all want freedom in one way or the other. We just don't know how to find it. I think you're right. I think it, it is a yearning. It, it's, it is that. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we only find it by giving up the search in some way. We only find what we want by giving up what we want into this abyss of nothingness. And it sounds so bleak and dark and nihilistic, like nothing. Well, nothing. to the mind, it is. To the yeah. mind's idea. Because when you become that process, if you say, well, right, okay, so I've got to go through an abyss, have I? Well, that's terrifying, isn't it? But, <laughs> yeah. but that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't necessarily happen to everybody. You know, I, I, it happened to me because I was willing to let go of everything all in one go. And it just so happened to be granted. And uh, and I'd had no prior experience in in understanding that kind of process, so it was like a dying to self. Yep. But if you're guided, if you're if you're on a spirit, a proper spiritual quest or search, you you can wake up in a, a less disconcerting way. I'm sure of it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, though, I think something's got to die. Well, you know something, you're not going to let go of it. I think you're right. I think ultimately, and, and the, because I, you know, it's interesting. We got, we got so many directions here, couldn't we? And talk about so, yeah. many, things, so many aspects of it. So um, now there's another aspect of it. And, uh, um, and that is, and that is, there are three, I mean, Ramana talks about this. He talks about the three knots, you know, that, that have to undo that, you know, three knots of attachment that, equate to um ego death and and the first one of course is our mental view our mental identity 
and as I as I explained earlier on, and then and then there's that when I mean, that not clears, then there's the emotional uh, one. But what a lot of people don't really understand is is when you get past those two. Once you do get to that point where you think I've really awareness here has transcended the personal paradigm, and I'm allowing I'm allowing experience to occur within consciousness itself and just remain as that. When life itself becomes a meditation, mm. what happens then is is that this knot of the body starts to will come and it's actually quite can be quite disconcerting so if you're if you're going through that process but you've got someone who you can speak to it does help to, to oh, speak yeah. to someone if you're going through because it's not easy i mean it's like to, to think to, to go beyond body identification you can go beyond emotional identification and mental identity because because in the absence of that we all know it's just emptiness and it's wonderful liberation but to go beyond the physical uh frame of identity is it can feel quite physical sometimes, you know. This is where people get the what they call it, all the energy going everywhere and what have you. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, there is that. So, so if you are negotiating, uh, going beyond attachment, then yeah, of course you may need some guidance. You may need some help, or mm -hmm. or be like me and just completely, you know, explode. You know. <laughs> yeah, man. Um... Well, that's why people like you are here for guidance and to provide us with sound guidance, because I can tell you definitely do have this understanding within you, man. I sense the resonance through time and space. Our minds have merged, as ah, we said. Yes, we are <laughs> merging. You and I have a connection, Gary. Yeah, man. I have to say. Yeah, I feel it. And that's, uh, that's the magic that I've come to find is that truly we are all connected, um, non-locally, non-linearly. And doing this has been proof to me. All you got to do is just settle the mind and you'll be able to find that merging, that essence of connectivity that we all have. Yeah. It's real. And um, it's not like we don't have to be in the same room, right? You're miles away. Oh, no. You're across the Atlantic Ocean. And maybe people feel it in the future that aren't even in this moment with us. Like they feel merged with us in this conversation. There's proof right there. I, 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 I believe. I believe that I, th I think you're you're you are close to uh essential nature and the way you merge you do actually merge Gary I, I can see it and um I bet you are the sort of person that if someone's thought of you you definitely pick it up or if you're in a, if you have mm -hmm. a partnership with someone you can feel that I think that mm -hmm. there is there is the communication but it's in the non-local isn't it is there yeah. is the, in, in that beyond space and time we, we do know things it, it's Mm -hmm. um yeah and in the i think in the future you're you're quite right I, th I think as we understand that more um you know we we can start developing more of a hive thinking i, I was thinking this a mm -hmm. few months ago. people talk about hive thinking i think i think there is something in that hive thinking. it's not like a thinking of the mind it's more of a telepathic sort of um you know just reading of consciousness you know yep yeah. probably sounds crazy but i i this is what i think now it's nothing's impossible when it, you know no no way we're just uh different nodes of the same mind that's what i like to mm. like to say and see it as and we are just waking up to that and i see the material world right now as a reflection of what we're realizing we always were like the internet and all of this technology is just the outward reflection of what we're truly realizing that we always were this we always have the internet we always I were like connected. That. Yeah, yeah i like that I like that this is just like a crude representation of yeah. the true non-local and non-linear telepathy yeah. that we're always tapped into it's like to, to go to go to go into that more it's like i say to people what do you see here there's a glass i say but if you take away the thought glass and wear glass what do you see and they said i don't know i say it is the self mm -hmm. everything is the self everything when That's when it. you yeah it's like like when there's no thought of something there's just the direct experience isn't there you know there's consciousness and that appear whatever you know and there's there's everything is the self um uh, you know this is where the journey gets interesting and i think you know if you know they talk about the cities don't they in, in the indian they, they even talk about the gifts of the spirit in christianity don't they really true yeah no they're Miracles. the same city. yeah you know all that you know so mm -hmm. going beyond space and time i think you know 
a lot a lot can be learned a lot can be done yeah magic true magic <laughs> it is true magic actually because I, I i'm not into um occult or magic or anything like that but because um I always thought there was something willful about it, something mm -hmm. deviant about it. But but uh, yeah. recently, I realised that what they mean by magic is is that is the essential nature being revealed, and what you know, how that can um, express itself, you know, mm -hmm. in, beyond human limitation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the difference between dark magic and light magic is will, as you spoke, and intention. Is that where does this yeah. magic come from? It's the same yeah. essence of like working with energy and bending yeah. space and time in the material world in some kind of way. But it's like, where does that come from? You know, wh how is this energy being used? Is it being used for truth or is it being used for some kind of inner, um, inner, Im your, your ambitions, your, your inhibitions that are uh, like self serving? Like, where does it serve? Does it serve God? Does this magic serve God? Does it serve your pleasure seeking? You know what I mean? I think that's the difference between it's the same magic. It's the same essence that we're talking about now, yeah. but it's the, it's like, where does it all come from? And that's why it's could be looked at as satanic because there's no surrender to God in that. Right. <laughs> you've got to, you've got to do it for no one. Ultimately you've got to, yeah. you've got to love for no one. You've got to help people. And no for reason. No absolutely you know um and that that's where the magic is i think i think i yeah. think that's where and it becomes a flow where it's meant to go you know and there's such liberation when you do some do something for no one i love that you know just to, yeah yeah just because instead of mining <clears throat> instead of being that self-contracting mining of one's instinctual nature you know the way we can exaggerate our instincts we can say right okay i'm very ambitious and we can exaggerate that and become completely self-centered you know mm -hmm. or we can or we can be aware of that and instead instead of mining from the body and you know from all that mind the body identification we can instead be awareness and learn to relate from within that awareness there's such resource in that and it's got nothing to do with the body isn't that amazing wow truly True, true resource, and 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 there you're no one. In there, there's no image, mm. and that's real power, mm. not egotistical power of trying to, you know, change people's will and influence others. It's yeah. power to co-create, cooperative power, power yeah, exactly. that is beyond entropy as well. Power to have this sort of momentum in one's expression, and yeah, uh, yeah that's beautiful right it's uh, at the end of the day like what are we doing this for like why do we love others for no reason why do we have this it's so that you love someone for no reason i think when it you know that's when you really love someone for no reason you know yeah it, you know prior to the condition of any appearance is love isn't it is, is that's it it's that place of, of unconditional sort of yeah seeing and that's yeah. what it's all about <laughs> that's what it so. really comes down to I, I believe so i believe so yeah Yep. And I believe, for lack of a better word, that's how we become happy and um, see through our suffering is we really just love others. It's that simple. Be happy. Exactly. Be happy for no reason at all. Mm -hmm. Be happy. And then you realize that happiness is, is prior the, you know, it's prior the condition of, you know, mm -hmm. but we give so much happiness to a state, you know, you know, it's, I explain to people, you know, you can have a bad day or a good day, but in your essential nature, you wouldn't, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't yeah, choose exactly. one over the other. Yeah. Just happening, you know? Yep. <sighs> I feel it. It's real stuff, Steve. Well, Gary, I, I have to say we've meandered my friend. We have, <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, it's a good talk. I think we can probably start to wrap it up. Um, I think we said everything and we needed to say yet yeah, there's so absolutely. much more we could say oh, you know? much. <laughs> it's um, yeah I don't know man I feel it it's really just comes down to a direct subjective experience at the end of the day and hopefully this so. served for everybody listening to have that or to be guided to that or to I hope so I, I do hope so because we all 
you know everyone um you know you can hear something and it just it could be that one thing as you said but it could just touch something true in you and, and liberate you in understanding something you know yeah um, well if no one else it helped me <laughs> it was a nice reminder for me <laughs> absolutely how, how long have you been uh like this gary i mean obviously you've got a very inquiry you know you, the way you use words is, is wonderful the way you ask questions and everything um Thanks, man. how long have you been doing this well the podcast specifically about three four years now oh but i've always been inquisitive i've always yeah. had this knack of what the heck's going on here man yeah yeah and uh it was just never directed in the right way it was always directed toward science and I was an atheist for a very long time. I would have never thought to use the G word. No way. But I like to say atheists are halfway there. They're yes. almost there. Keep going and you'll eventually find out what God really means. So I um, completely rejected the idea of God, got into the religion of science, you could say. And then there was still that yearning that we spoke of. There was still that like, yeah. but yeah. there's, there's got to be more. And I would always look for more in understanding yeah. the cosmos and physics and stuff like that yeah. but it only goes so far it's like you're um this is something that i spoke with uh someone the other day he said it's like you're in a fishbowl and you're trying to swim out of the fishbowl you can never get out of the fishbowl by swimming out so that's what i i felt like i was trying to like get out of the fishbowl which is going around and around with all of this trying to understand it logically and rationally and then um that eventually, I don't want to get too much into it, but that eventually led to, you know, just general amount mental illness. And that led me down, a, right? Of course, <laughs> of course. Absolutely. And that led me down a path of like, okay, well, I don't feel good. I'm going to try and feel good through self-improvement. And yeah. got into I mean. like exercise, but mainly physical yoga. And that physical yoga is what paved the way for me to get into, you know, what yoga was really about. Yes, you know, it's powerful, isn't it, yoga? Yeah. The real self improvement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it all stemmed from that that yearning and like, hey, there's got to be another way. That point of exhaustion, as we spoke of, and then I've had plenty of experiences, plenty of uh, points of seeing, of understanding, of realizing, and here I am doing this. This is just another step in my side, and I feel is speaking to people like you. It's very powerful to be able to do yeah. this. And I suggest everybody try that. You don't even have to do a podcast, right? You don't have to put it on the internet, even though putting it on the internet may allow you to speak with people. <laughs> That's what I've come to find. It's like, I would have these conversations without recording and putting them on the internet, but it just so happens that I'm able to have more conversations by putting them on the internet. But my point is, <laughs> right, you get what I'm saying? My point yeah. is, is just find others that you can connect with and you may be able to find that that is a, it's a meditation in a way. It's a um, it's a beautiful way to drop in, as you said, to the moment and to this awareness. If you can find somebody yeah. that understands it themselves and yeah. a guide that can allow you to allow yourself to um, come into this awareness, you will find that it'll it'll just be a great help. So yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's my path and a little bit of a synopsis right there for you. <laughs> I love your path and I love what you're doing with it. I love the channel you have, the help that you're offering people by by having this library of wonderful speakers. Of course. You know, and, and your inquiry, it really gets people to talk. It's wonderful. Yeah, man. Well, yeah. it's only possible because of people like you. So on that note, I wish you all the best and keep doing your thing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, you know, it's been lovely talking to you. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, peace and love to you, Steve, yeah. and peace and love to the listener. Peace and love. Namaste. You take care. God bless you. Namaste. Carry. God bless. Take care. Bye.